when I got out of college and I got the first job, which was a big four accounting firm, you know, I was sitting in a cubicle working 90 hours a week and always out of town. And I was, I was running the numbers. I'm like, okay, I'm making 50 K, but I'm working 90 hours a week. And I'm like, I'm making less than people make at McDonald's yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. and it's way more stressful. So I was like, I got to figure out something else. Cam Cathcart, welcome to the show again. Dude, it was a blast being with you. Dude, I lo- this show was phenomenal today. Josiah Smelzer is our guest, and he is a rock star real estate investor. We talked about a ton of cool things today. Uh, what was your highlight for you? Ooh, learning about how I am not investing wisely. <laughs> um, not necessarily, but it was a gr- that was a great moment. It. Yeah, I loved it. We tore apart your portfolio mm-hmm. and your cash flow. Yes. And we talked about how you could make a million dollars a year and you're only making 160. Yeah, so <laughs> that. And then I learned a lot. I made on... you a million dollars today, just so you know. Dude, I, so, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I You did. And it's going to make other people watching this show a million dollars today. It, it's definitely going to make me think. Yes. I'm yeah. not there yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, it's going to make, make me think a lot. It makes you um, think a lot. And then I loved about, well, just talking about his career as an appraiser, because yeah. I think that's, you know, w- with us being single family people or me yeah. being a single family person, um, just learning what appraisers are thinking and what's going through their head. That's, yeah. That was awesome. Well, I think you're all going to love this show. So mm-hmm. we're going to get right into it today. I'm excited to bring you our episode with Josiah Smelzer. Josiah Smelzer, welcome to the podcast, man. Man, I'm so pumped to be here. Good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. All right, so I know you as a real estate investor. I know you've done Burr. I know you do some luxury Airbnb. I want to talk about that today. I know you lived on the Appalachian Trail for a few months. I want to talk about that. I know you had some crazy out-of-country experiences. I know all that about you. I know you were an appraiser, a finance professor, broker, all that stuff. But before all of that, before a super successful, good-looking Josiah, who was Josiah Smelzer? Take us back. Yeah, so... uh... You know, I was just a, a kid like most kids growing up in the U.S., small town U.S. I grew up in Florence, Alabama. Okay. Uh, it's North Alabama. And, uh, I, you know, I'll, I'll kind of focus in on a really um, formative part of my uh, growing up, which was my parents moving us to Tanzania for a year. So we moved to Tanzania, mm. which was East Africa, uh, when I was 12 years old. And uh, it made such a huge impression on me because, you know, we had all the all the niceties of, you know, that we have in the U.S. that we take for granted, yeah. running water, air conditioning, you know, low cr- – I mean, the area I grew up, low crime, mm-hmm. paved streets, you know, all, all, the, all the things that we really take for granted, low unemployment, you know. We moved to, to Tanzania. My, my dad's a doctor. My mom's a nurse. So they volunteered at this mission hospital. So they gave up a year of income. We moved over there, and we were, we were an hour from the closest telephone. Wow. There was no air conditioning. Couldn't drink the water out of the tap. You know, we didn't have carpet. We slept under mosquito nets. Um, no internet, of course. Mm-hmm. You know, no cable. Like, I was, I was a huge Braves fan when I was a kid and really into baseball and baseball cards and all that. And uh, I, could, I, didn't even, I couldn't even – get the scores on my team's games and stuff. Like I went from like watching baseball every night to like not knowing what happened for a year, you know? So, uh, and then my, you know, I became friends with the local kids and, you know, they're living in one room mud huts Mm -hmm. and, you know, they're, they're having to boil their water if there was water available. I mean, like they're, some of them are having to, to go 30 minutes away and carry water and these buckets on their heads, like you see on, on, you know, on TV. So, you know, I got I got exposed to that from a young age, and that that really reminded me and taught me like how blessed we are here. Mm-hmm. So when I came back, it's like I had this crazy experience. Come back, and it's like I'm right back in the same um, environment I was in before. But now I've got this new um, this new reality that man, we're so blessed. We have so many amazing things like running water, clean water. Air conditioning. Yeah. Mm-hmm. See, getting to watch our favorite teams on TV, going out to McDonald's. I mean, people think McDonald's is trash, <laughs> but when you go without something like McDonald's for a year, I was like, when we got to the airport and there was a Burger King, I had like tears in my eyes. I was so happy <laughs> to get some French fries and a cheeseburger. It's like little things you take for granted. And so, you know, that, that made a massive impression on me at a young age. And, you know, as I grew up, when I got older, I ended up going back to, to Tanzania uh, spent some time in Rwanda, but that was that made a massive impression on me. The reason I bring that up to begin with, you know, um, 
that's probably one reason I became an entrepreneur is because I knew how blessed we are and the opportunities that we have here in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So I have to ask you this. When you were 12 years old, did you did you realize like, hey, this is a really great experience or did you hate your parents when they – hate's a strong <laughs> word. Were you mad at your parents? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I was always the kid that would – you know, when I got home from school, I'd get on my bike and I'd mm-hmm. take off. Yeah. Like I was out. And I, I my parents laughed because at one point I went door to door and on the three streets and met everybody in every house. Knocked <laughs> on the door, that. introduced myself, to, you know, and this was in the 80s, you know, when, when that, that's what we did. Mm-hmm. And I would take my bike out, ride trails, trade baseball cards, play Nintendo with my buddies, play outside. I wanted to be outside meeting people. So when my parents came up with this idea of going to Africa, I was excited about it because yeah. I was like, this is adventure. And that's what, it, that's, you know, you can kind of figure out who you are by what you did when you were a kid, Yeah, you know, and that, I was in for the adventure. So yeah, I, I didn't want to be away from my friends. They want to miss sports and baseball, the baseball I was really into and stuff. That's but when they had like Greg Maddox probably. And Greg Maddox, you know, John Smol- Glavin, Smoltz, Smoltz Avery, all the, Man. that was like, you know, it was killer. Mm-hmm. But, um, but yeah, so I had, a, I mean, I had a blast. I mean, I, I, I learned... Swahili, I learned the language. I, I got to be friends with all the kids. Like I would go down to the village, no no white people around, and I would just hang out with the locals. You That's know? Cool. Yeah. And and we went on these hunting trips and like it was just crazy. Like I remember I would I would finish school and I would head off in the mountains behind our house. And it was like backwoods, like deep underbrush, Africa. And I would just go back there with a couple kids mm-hmm. and we would just hike and explore. Yeah. And as my parents are like, there's lots of snakes and stuff. Like it's kind of a miracle I didn't get snake bit or something. But <laughs> but dude, it was so it was so cool. And so when I got back, I had this amazing experience. And I was trying to tell my friends about it. It's like, like, how do you tell somebody about that that hasn't yeah, experienced yeah. that? You know? So Yeah, it's almost like you aged probably multiple years yeah. in that year. Yeah. And you go exactly. back and all your friends are just immature 13 yeah. year olds and yeah. You're like, I'm 20 now. Yeah. <laughs> I think too, like, cause you said this, like that, that's one of the reasons that you became an entrepreneur was because you realized like the opportunity here. And yeah. I think that's so interesting. Cause we had, um, a while back on the podcast, we had some first generation, um, immigrants that were on the podcast and mm-hmm. all of them said the exact same thing that yeah. the United States is the best country in the world oh, for yeah. this. And, and then you hear that it's not, but it's typically from people like me that have grown up like, or, yeah, yeah. you know, that have grown up in a, and have never seen the world or have never come from that where it's like you yeah, didn't well, have the struggles. Yeah. Going in there. Yeah. When you have the opportunity that we have here, it's yeah. absurd. I mean, it, we got our problems in America, obviously. It's absurd. Yeah. But yeah. when it comes to defining your own path and building wealth and freedom. So let, let's move into that a little yeah. bit. Is what where did the idea of entrepreneurship come from? Did you start with real estate or I know you're an appraiser or you were an appraiser, are an appraiser? Were? Are you still, still okay. an appraiser? So, so appraiser what came and first and how'd you get any, walk us through that path of uh Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I was, you know, I was entrepreneurial from a young age. Um, when it came to making money, uh, there was the traditional, you know, get hired by someone to do something hourly. And then there was the go be creative and figure out a way to sell something. Mm-hmm. And that's what I would always do because I could make a lot more money for my time. Yeah, And that that to me is a very foundational part of entrepreneurship is figuring out how to maximize the value of your time, right? If you can build something and sell it and make a million dollars for a month of work versus sell your time at $10 an hour, it's obvious who's going to make more money, right? Mm -hmm. And so as a kid, I would, you know, we, we had those, that like magazine sales competition at school where they, they, I don't know how they, they're able to, to take that into schools and get kids to go sell their (laughs) magazines and stuff. But I like, I got, I got those magazines and went and sold the crap out of those things and won those little awards and stuff. And I I had the bug. I was like, man, I can, I can sell stuff. Like, cause I would get excited about it. I like meeting people, you know? And so when I got older, it was like uh, in college, my parents didn't give me money. It's like, if you want to go on a spring break trip, you got to figure out how to make the money. Well, it's like I could go work at Subway for $7 an hour or I could sell something. And so I remember I at one time I was I was um, going from my dorm to class and I noticed somebody had thrown a desk away. And so I just like pulled the desk out of the garbage can and I put it in the back of my truck and I drove it around and asked people if they wanted to buy it. And they bought it. It's like 200, <laughs> 250 bucks, you know, and I was like, that was my spring break money. So it was kind of like just recognizing a trait that a lot of us have that's like, uh, if you're willing to be creative and you're willing to like go talk to people, get out of your comfort zone, 
um, you can actually make a lot more money for your time. So, so when I got out of college and I got the first job, which was a big four accounting firm, you know, I was sitting in a cubicle working 90 hours a week and always out of town. And I was, I was running the numbers. I'm like, okay, I'm making 50 K, but I'm working 90 hours a week. And I'm like, I'm making less than people make at McDonald's yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. and it's way more stressful. So I was like, I got to figure out something else. So I left that job and helped a friend start an appraisal business. And I was 21 years old and made way more money. I was getting to wear jeans and a t-shirt and a baseball yeah. hat, ride around with my friends in a truck, listen to music I like. And I got into real estate. So I got mm-hmm. to go into houses all over Dallas, Fort Worth. And I got to figure out how to value homes. So that taught me that skill set where I could recognize value. Mm-hmm. And people always ask, like, should I go into appraisal? I'm like, it's not really the job of being an appraiser that's actually attractive. It's the skill set of learning how to recognize value. Because yeah. if you can recognize value in something, you know that deal AJ Osborne did where he bought that Kmart and converted yeah. that and made like 20 million bucks yeah. or 25 million or something? Yeah. That is, he recognized value there that other people didn't see. And as an appraiser, you can learn how to do that. So that got me into the entrepreneurship game. So how long have you been an appraiser? I, I became an appraiser in 2005. Okay. So going on 20 wow. years. Yeah. So I'm a single family guy, um, and I'm sure there's a lot of people listening that are single family people. So, and I have a love hate relationship with appraisers. <laughs> yeah, most primarily people do. hate. I actually yeah. have a love hate relationship <laughs> yeah. with them as well. So, like, what would be your like three tips for me or somebody listening that is getting into real estate and they're flipping a house or they're trying to do the Burr method on a rental property to come up with an accurate ARV? Yeah, that's a great question. Okay, so so accurate ARV is going to be you need got to nail your comps down, right? So I would say let's approach it from how to maximize your ARV. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. To maximize your ARV, you want to leave your place light and bright, right? Mm-hmm. When the appraiser's coming over, you don't want to have the utilities off, the place smelling terrible, yeah. filled with junk. That's not going to help your value because whether you like it or not, they're looking at the place and they're getting an impression of mm-hmm. it. And then they're going to go pull comps, right? Yeah. And you want them to pull the best comps available. So that's another piece is – Know your comps, know your comparables. So if you've got a house right down the street that was fully renovated and it's got stainless steel, granite, whatever, and it's selling for two hundred dollars a foot, and it's a in some it's a similar size to yours, you know that you have to have that that same amenity finish mm-hmm. to get that two hundred dollars a foot. So leave it light and bright. Have your amenities updated similar to your comparables, mm-hmm. and then the third tip to maximizing your ARV with an appraiser is like literally. Get out of their way and let them do their job. Like, don't text them off the hook. Don't be, okay. don't be calling them. Don't be telling them, "Hey, I need to get this value." Like, mm-hmm. that's not how it works. Like, if it, it's just like anything else. Like, the more you ride somebody, the more resistant they're going to be. So, just like let them do their job and kind of, kind of take a step back and give them some space. Right? Yeah. When I and I still do this, so maybe I should stop. But when when I need an appraiser or an appraiser to appraise it somewhere where I need it at, and yeah. I'm worried that it's going to be tight. I will tell them how much I need, and then I'll yeah. give the comps to prove it. So you're saying don't do that. I'm saying don't tell them how much you need. Uh-huh. Just providing comparable sales is a great thing to do, I uh-huh. think, because they could miss a comp. Like a lot, sometimes, for instance, let's say there's a new build. Mm-hmm. A lot of those new build sales, they're not on the MLS. Mm-hmm. So if a builder, if I'm appraising a house and a builder walks up, here's three comps, my most recent sales, not on the MLS. That's really helpful to me as an appraiser. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A lot of times... The, the, the problem is people are trying to get you to use comps that aren't very comparable, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So That almost hurts your case probably. That almost hurts your case, your yeah, because what will yeah. happen, worst case scenario for the appraiser, somebody says, hey, man, this house is worth 250 and you're looking and it's worth 150 And yeah. you're like, okay, why is it worth 250 Well, because I got these comparables and they give you the comps and it's like that house is 700 square feet bigger and it's in a completely different neighborhood and it's brand new and your yeah. house is yeah. 30 years old not updated, and it's way smaller. Like, that doesn't help you any. Like, you're just showing that you actually don't know what it's worth, yeah. right? So, yeah, so that's that's kind of – so, like, don't try to force the appraiser to value it at, at something because the appraiser is coming up with their own opinion of value. Mm-hmm. So it's their opinion, and it has to be supported with data. Mm-hmm. So approach everything from the data perspective. I feel like, though, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, an appraiser – I mean, you could take a property that's $200,000 property – and I could find data to tell me it's worth 250, and I could find data to tell me it's 150. That's a massive swing. But there, you could find, and and, and the higher amount you do, the harder you have to, as an appraiser have to work to find those deals because they're not going to be just everyone, right? You have to you dig in, you have to actually really look at it, 
versus the easy path, the lazy path is like, well, that one, that one, and that one, even though they're just REOs that, you know, like we're foreclosed on and of course they're cheap, but it's easy for you. So in other words, the easier, it is easier to appraise low than to appraise high. And so an appraiser will have to work more minutes or hours to get a higher appraisal. So where I'm going with that is there's a huge component to getting the appraiser to like you, I feel like, because if they like you and they know that at least have some idea of what that you needed to appraise high, you know, they're more likely to put in that extra effort to help you because they like you. And if they don't like you because you're just a jerk to them or you're short with them or you're texting them constantly, it's just gonna they're gonna be like, well, I'll just go the easier out and just get, you know, screw them. Like, yeah, <laughs> I'm not gonna bust my butt for this person who's just being mean to me. Yeah. Yeah. They're so an appraiser worth their salt should appraise it in a pretty narrow range consistently. Mm-hmm. The problem is there's appraisers out there that are worried about getting sued. Yes. Mm. So they're going to be very conservative. You also have the human element that comes into play. Yeah. Right? Like, if you look at something and I look at something, even though we're looking at the same thing, we may see it slightly differently. Yeah. So an appraiser provides an opinion of value. So... Mm. One guy may consistently come in low on stuff. The next guy may consistently come in a little higher. They're both licensed. and They're both using comps that are fair to use. However, there are standards that you're supposed to use, and you should be coming in in a similar range. Mm-hmm. So, so the guys that are coming in really conservative because they're worried about being sued may not be yeah. doing their job properly. Yeah. So, so during 2008, when that whole thing went down in flames, we were running that appraisal business. Well, all those – all those clients that had come to us and called us and say, hey, I need 250 on this. Can you get me 250 We're like, that's not how this works. They would hang up, and they would call another guy who yeah. could get them 250 Well, guess what happened to all those guys when those deals went belly up? They sued those appraisers, yep. mm. and those appraisers lost their licenses. Well, the people who survived that, all the appraisers, they're like, well, next time the yeah. real estate market implodes, I don't want them coming after me, so they get really conservative. Yeah. Yeah. So the right thing to do as an appraiser is let the data read the situation. Like you don't want to try to make a value for somebody. Mm-hmm. You don't want to kill a deal because you don't like somebody. Yeah. Yeah. You want to let the data read the whole thing. That's how you're supposed to do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but today we can't really choose our own appraisers anyway. No, right? you like, can't choose the, your the appraiser. Bank chooses it. Yeah. Yeah. The bank, the, or the, 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 yeah, this, this is actually be helpful for the listeners. All right. People call me and say, Hey, I'm thinking about buying a house. Could you be my appraiser? I'm like, okay, that's not how this works. The appraisal is there to protect the lender. Right. Mm-hmm. So if you're flipping a house and you go borrow money and you may be, you could even be using hard money. Um, the hard money lender sometimes want an appraisal. If you're just using cash, you don't need an appraisal. Mm-hmm. Right. But if you've got a lender involved of any form or fat or uh, of any sort, they're going to need an appraisal to make sure the asset, the collateral is worth what they're lending. So if they have to take it back from you, they could sell it and recover their money. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's what the appraisal is for. So it has nothing to do with the buyer. It's the lender that's trying to be yeah. protected. So can I ask you a couple questions? Yes. Um, and you just throw out ballpark numbers. Um, okay. But it's just things that I'm always interested in, and I get it asked to me all the time. Yeah. So um, what is the difference between a garage and a carport on a house? Just a, ballpark number. A gar- like a, like a like house a- has a garage. Maybe your house only has a carport. What would you say like you should deduct from your ARV if it's the exact same comp, but one has a garage, one has a carport? So you're not going to like my answer. Uh-huh. It, it depends. <laughs> it depends. It depends. Uh, it depends because it's about what that neighborhood values that garage at per mm-hmm. square foot, right? So if the neighborhood, like like for instance, in Austin, Texas, mm-hmm. um, people convert their garages because square footage is is, is in gotcha. such high demand. So if you've got a garage, well, you could convert that. So that's really valuable, right? Mm-hmm. If you've got a carport, you got to close it in, mm-hmm. you know, insulate it, heat and air, all that. So it's more expensive. So. You know, in that situation, if the garage is more valuable, if the market's paying more for that, as an appraiser, you could find a garage sale, and then you could find a carport sale, and you do what's called a paired comparison. You say, you know, in in, in a perfect world, both houses are 1,300 square feet, both houses are three-bedroom, two-bath, mm-hmm. and you can isolate that garage versus carport component and say what the market is paying for the for the garage versus the carport, uh-huh. Then you can make an adjustment based on that. That's how appraisal is supposed to be done. A lazy appraiser is just going to say twenty five hundred, yeah. yeah, and they're just pulling it out of thin air, right? So, <laughs> so the answer of de- it depends is the right answer because it's going to be market dependent, and the market's going to tell you what that is. Gotcha. Yeah, because if I make the same adjustment in Hawaii for a garage versus Florence, Alabama, well, Hawaii is going to be way more expensive because because yeah. everything's so much more expensive here. 
That makes sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I want to get into your real estate investing journey a little bit, but before we do, yeah. I want to get to this week's show sponsor. Now, one thing we do on the show, it's a little different, is we ded- dedicate 100% of all the ad revenue toward a charity of the guest choosing. So this week, where are we sending the money from the ads? Yeah, we're going with my parents' nonprofit. It's Christian Services Foundation. Christian Services Foundation. Christian what do they do? Services Foundation. Yeah. So, so my parents. I, I told you about moving to Tanzania when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, they ended up going back uh, when I was in my late twenties. They've been there for. We're, they're going on twenty years now. But they started a hospital and a school wow. in a rural part of Tanzania. And Christian Services Foundation is what is the nonprofit that holds their their hospital and school. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Very so cool. yeah, I'm I'm really uh really really love what they're doing with that. The the hospital serving, you know, people in underserved area that really need healthcare and then the school is a secondary school. Tanzania doesn't have enough secondary schools so the kids go through elementary and then they just kind of stop working and then you've got a lot of people that are uneducated and how do you pull yourself out of poverty yeah. if you're not being educated. So yeah. the secondary schools just I mean, it's it's so awesome to see these kids doing so well, and they got the highest grades on the national exams of any school, secondary school in the whole country. Wow! And ta- the Tanzanian government officials who came to my parents are like, "What are y'all doing here? Like, this doesn't <laughs> say how is this happening?" And they're like, "We're just hiring good teachers and trying yeah. to educate these kids." So, so yeah, cool so, man. Real. Yeah. Well, we will do that. Well, this week's show is sponsored by Open Door Capital, as my real estate fund, my company that I run. We have. Over 13,000 units at this point. Now, specifically, I want to give you guys something. I don't want this to be an ad, so I want to give you all something. Um, the property that you currently own, if you own property right now, we just talked a little bit about, about you know appraisals. The property you own is probably worth a lot more than what you bought it for. It's probably gone up in value over time, which means you likely have equity. If you are a real estate investor, you have equity. Now, could you take that equity, sell the property, and then go buy something else and make a higher return? Possibly, but how do you know? That's called a return on equity calculation. And at Opener Capital, we want to give you a free return on equity calculator. It's a spreadsheet. You can download it for free right now to see if there's a better way for you to use your equity. Now, maybe you're going to buy your own property. Maybe you're going to invest it in Opener Capital. I don't know. Either way, I want to give you that free uh, spreadsheet. Just go to odcfund.com slash ROE, ROE, like return on equity. That's odcfund.com slash ROE. It's totally free. So check it out. Back to you, Josiah. Real estate investing, your journey. Where'd the first property come from? Walk us through that. First property was a house hack. Um, okay. This was this was before I'd ever heard anything about Bigger Pockets. Okay. Um, when did when did y'all start Bigger Pockets? When was Bigger Pockets started? Ooh, good question. I think it's twenty years old now. So okay. Josh would have started it twenty years ago, and the podcast started 12, 11, 12 okay. years ago. Yeah. So this was two thousand and four. Okay. Yeah, so, it would have been. Like just being yeah. birthed then, yeah. I mean, I, I it might know. have been an, at the you know at the time bigger pockets what it was before real estate. Have you heard about this? No. So bigger pockets before even when the name was invented, Josh wasn't doing real estate yet. Yeah. So it was a site for actors to learn how to make more money <laughs> as an actor. <laughs> was yeah. Josh an actor? Yeah, Josh was an actor, and so really? yeah, Josh was actually on a couple episodes of like SNL as like an extra what? or like a, a, really? you know no a, bit, a character actor in uh, SNL and a few other Dude, a bunch of movies. Uh, anyway, so Josh started that, but then. He didn't get any traction, like, so he pivoted uh, and was like, "Well, why don't I teach real estate investing through this name, Bigger Pockets?" So Bigger Pockets started as an actor oh, thing. That's very cool. Anyway, sorry, okay, keep going. No, so um, house hack. Yeah, yeah. So, so did a house hack. Um, what was that like? Single family house or sing, duplex? Single family house in Fort Worth, Texas. Okay. Uh, it was a it was a three bedroom. I actually converted the garage on it, and um, and rented it out to my friends. So you know, I found myself at one point. I had three roommates. I was cash flow positive, you know, on on my mortgage, so I was living for free, and then I fixed the house up, and then I, I bought the house down the street and did a flip and made money on that as well, and uh, and at the same time I was learning appraisal, I would got my real estate license, and um, I was kind of off to the races. How'd and, you finance that first flip? A lot of people struggle with that first flip. How to get the money for that's it? That's a great question. I, I you know I think I just went to the bank. Oh really? I, yeah. I didn't like there, no bigger pockets. I had yeah, no yeah. clue about private money, yeah. and I had you know I was not listening to anything. I was just like, how do I buy a house? That's yeah. what pretty much everybody does. I think with their first deals, they just go to the bank. Yeah. And they mm-hmm. put twenty percent down, right? Yep. Um, but I, but I'll never forget the lady across the street that this house was in bad shape. It was a foreclosure. The lady across the street told me right after I'd closed on it, she was like, you just bought that? She was like, you're going to lose so much money. <laughs> I mean, this older lady. And I was like, 
I, I, I had when I sold it. I think I think I made like twenty five thousand dollars on this flip mm-hmm. or something. I was like, the thought crossed my mind. Man, I should go get this money in like cash, cash in a wheelbarrow. Just, <laughs> just wheel it right up to her front door and knock and be like, it worked out. That's mm-hmm. such a good yeah, lesson in yeah. not in remembering that not to listen to people who shouldn't be listened oh, yeah. to about this topic, no. right? Like totally. What do they know? Yeah. I mean, then people have told me the same thing. You're gonna lose money on that. Oh, oh yeah. don't do real estate. It's a bad idea. I, I think it's honestly kind of like. It's the test for should I do it? Yeah. <laughs> if you come up with an idea and you tell somebody, and then somebody that's kind of a naysayer, negative type, mm-hmm. tells you, no, you really shouldn't do that. You're yeah. like, okay, now, yeah, now, no, now we're really going to do this. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I did that. And then I left. Uh, so I sold my real estate and went and hiked the Appalachian Trail. Yeah. And tell so, us about yeah, that. Yeah. So I sold that. the real estate in like early 2008, like late 2007, early to. Good so time I, to missed, get out. I missed the <laughs> meltdown. I mean, that was just luck. But, <laughs> but uh, went on the Appalachian Trail and and I went with a friend from college and hiked Georgia to Pennsylvania. So we did 1,100 miles and it was three and a half months of like living out of a backpack. And the really liberating thing about it, you know, the the podcast being a better life. Like I felt like I had the best life in the yeah. world. Like I, I was I was single. I had sold everything I owned, and I had I had the small amount of possessions I had in a tiny little storage unit. And I had everything in my backpack, had no debt. And I was, I was living out of a backpack in a tent with a friend hiking the trail off on the Appalachian trail. And it was the best thing ever. And I was seeing parts of the country that you'll never see otherwise going through these tiny little towns. And the coolest part about the AT for anybody out there thinking about doing it, which I highly recommend by the way, Mm -hmm. I think you would love it. Your beard, you probably got the beard (laughs) for it, man. Um, You get trail names. Okay, so you don't get to pick your trail name; you just get a trail name. So, so the, I got the trail name Respect. So, Ooh. so it's like out there, nobody knows you by your name. Nobody, nobody knows Josiah out there. They're just like, oh, that's Respect. But anyway, funny. I befriended this Vietnam War veteran, and I mean, just all these just amazing characters out there. But the coolest thing is, while you're hiking, you'll come down out of the mountains and you'll come to a road, and there'll just be a table set up with just complete strangers there, and just a spread of food like ice cream, <laughs> burgers, hot dogs. Wow. Everything. And it's just, it's just, they call them trail angels. Really? And these people just go out there and they do nice stuff for hikers. And like, you'll sit down at this amazing meal and you're like starving hungry out there. Cause think about it, you're hiking up and down mountains all day and you'll sit down at this amazing meal with these complete strangers and some of the nicest people I've ever met in my life. Some mm. of the greatest meals I've ever had was meeting these complete strangers. They'll even sometimes like have you over their house. Like I remember... Mm. This one uh, couple had me over, and they were like, hey, you can get any book you want off this bookshelf. And it was all, like, C.S. Lewis books and stuff. Mm, So I got, like, two C.S. Lewis books, took those with me, read them, and then put them in a hiker box, let other hikers Mm -hmm. uh, um, have those books. But it was just amazing stuff like that. One of my friends did it, and he said it's, like, halfway point or somewhere along the line that you have to stop. And at one of these small towns, you buy a a gallon of ice cream and eat it. Yes. Was that – did you finish your gallon? gallon challenge. No, I didn't (laughs) – You didn't do it? I I have a lactose intolerance. If I I (laughs) eat ice cream, it destroys me. So – but I didn't know about that. The yeah. gallon challenge. Yeah, That's yeah. funny, man. There's a lot of crazy stuff like that out there. Yeah. You know, th- there is some truth to, like, I just got in from five days of camping in the Grand Canyon with Rosie, right? We did the nice. UTV thing, camping in the Grand Canyon. And I thought of this while I was out there. I had no phone, no technology, no clock, no watch. I didn't know what time it was. And the entire thing, my spirits were lifted. I was enjoying things. My back didn't hurt, which is wild. That Why would my back not hurt when I'm out in the wild, like, sleeping on a rock, mm-hmm. like, I didn't have a pillow, like all this stuff, yet my back didn't hurt. I wasn't sad or down or feel like everything was great for five, six days, despite the struggle. And I remember thinking like, there is a strong connection between a, like living a better life and nature. Yes. And, and I think that in modern civilizations, we are just losing it. Like we're just yes. more and more and more losing that connection. And in result, we're seeing anxiety go up. We're seeing depression go up. We're seeing all these problems. And what if the answer was just to get outside more? And do yeah. more things. I read a quote the other day that just, uh, rocked me. Just said, do more things uh, that make you forget your phone. And yes. I was like, well, such a great, I simple thing. Do more things in life that make you forget to check your phone. I love it. Uh, yeah, I'm going to make a t-shirt about that. You can get a t-shirt <laughs> at, uh, at abetterlife.com slash shirt. Uh, I don't know if I'll have that URL <laughs> yeah. made. But if <laughs> I do, that shirt's going to be on there. Uh, do more things that make you forget to check your phone. Yes. Uh, that's going to give you a better life. Yes. For sure. I, I, I felt... I just have so many memories of walking through the mountains. You know, sometimes we I would get kind of behind my friend or ahead of him, and I'd be by myself just yeah. out in the middle of the woods, like, you know, I would say an hour or two from the closest mm-hmm. road, yeah. just up in the mountains, just quiet, like the air is so clean. Yeah. 
I would come to a stream, fill your water bottle up, drinking out of these streams, and the water is pure and good, and it's like so exhilarating. And I remember feeling so close to God. Like yeah. I would spend time in prayer. You know, it was just like, and it's just like this. It's it's the anti anxiety. Yep. Yeah. Like you're saying, like if you want to, to me, like if you're struggling with anxiety, you need to get outside yeah. and like get quiet. Yeah. yeah. Right. It was so cool. It was so cool. There's there's studies all the yeah. time that show that sun sunshine yeah. is the best antidepressant out there. Yeah. Um, better than yeah, there, any SSRI or anything like that. There, there's a meme that's go. I see like a video meme that goes around like Instagram and TikTok. I see it a lot where someone would be like, "Oh, I'm sure I'm feeling down today," and then the person, you know, it's usually the same person acting two characters. Yeah. Like, "Well, did you go outside today? No. Did you drink yeah. any water today? Not much. Did you? <laughs> uh, were you on your phone all day? Yeah, mostly. And it just goes through this yeah. long list yeah. of stuff that we yeah. all do." And it's just like, it's so obvious. Like, why do we feel down? Because we're doing everything wrong all yeah. the time. Yeah. Uh, and it starts with, yeah, getting outside more. So yeah, I love that. If you try to drive yourself crazy, I mean, just turn on a bunch of notifications yeah, and stick yeah. it in your ear. That's what <laughs> yeah. we do all day. Yep. And that'd be the best way to drive yourself nuts. And then like the cool thing out there is it's quiet. Yeah. You got clean water and you're exercising yeah. all day. Mm-hmm. So exercise obviously does a lot for you as well. I mean, yeah. that's, that's, that goes without saying, but you're doing that all day, every day. And you're with friends. And you've got no agenda. It's not like you're stressed about anything. Your agenda is get up, hike, yeah, and get to the next point and go to bed. Yeah. <laughs> so it was awesome. That's amazing, man. Uh, you know, one of my favorite books I'll, I'll recommend to people, it's, it's a, kind of a sleeper book. No one's heard of it probably. It's called Bothy Tales, B-O-T-H-Y, hmm. Bothy Tales. A Bothy is this little like hiker's cabin in Scotland. And so they're all hmm. over. There's over 100 of them all throughout Scotland. And they were, you know, old farmhouses, old schoolhouses, old like – Garages, whatever, out in the middle of nowhere, and then they've converted them. They have this nonprofit called the the like the Bothy organization or well, something like that. They volunteers come through, fix them up, and turn them into just like stone tents is the best way to say. Uh-huh. It. There's no heat, no you have a fireplace, but there's no electricity, no bathroom, whatever. They're all over <clears> Scotland. So this Bothy Tales book is just one guy just telling stories of hiking through Scotland. And then sleeping at these bothies. That's and it's awesome. just such a brilliant book. And That's if you listen awesome. to it on Audible, the guy's got the perfect you know, oh, yeah. accent <laughs> and like everything Scottish. is just great. Yeah, I love that book. Yeah. So, but it just reminds you, just every chapter, I'm just like, I just need to get outside more yes. and, and yes. walk more. So, all right, man. But let's go back to the US buying real estate. I know you got back into it again at some point. When did that happen? Yes. Yes. So, uh, went to grad school, met my wife, and, and ended up a finance professor on the college level at Harding University for two years. While I was there, I found Brandon Turner and Josh Dorkin <laughs> doing their thing on Bigger Pockets. I got, you know, and I had always really loved real estate um, just because I felt like it was the perfect combo of like entrepreneurial yeah. opportunity, yeah. It, you know, sales. Um, plus, I always, I mean, just as a kid, I remember, you know, going around on my bike and neighborhoods looking at all these houses. Like, these houses are so cool looking. They all look different. Like something about houses I always loved. Um, so I was like, in you know, having learned appraisal, I was like, okay, I feel like I'm dangerous enough at this that I could, I can make some money at this. Well, you know, college professors don't get paid very well, at least where I was, I wasn't, I wasn't getting paid very well. And I had a friend approach me, he had a great year in sales. And he was like, I've got $200,000. I don't feel like I know what I'm doing enough to well enough to do real estate. He's like, I feel like you know what you're doing, but I don't know how we could work together, but I want to get into real estate investing. What could we do here? And I was like, well, I don't have $200,000, but I feel like I could find us deals. So I was like, let's let's make a deal here. You put the money in and I'll cut you a deal that we'll, we'll go 50-50 on everything. And I'll I'll make sure you get every penny of your money back before I get anything in profit. But I'll do, I'll do all the work. I'll do everything. I'll find the deals. I'll run point on the renos. I'll run point with the lenders. I'll run point with the refinances and and, I, and then I'll run point on getting the proper management in there. And that's what we did. So by the I, way, can I interrupt you real quick? Yeah, just I want everyone listening to, to realize this. I'm gonna make this a clip for YouTube and for Instagram and everything. That is the single greatest way I think the average person with no money can get into real estate. You yes. just laid it out exactly there. Like there is not a single person alive that today that can't get into real estate by doing exactly what you just said. Absolutely. It, it's, it's so simple and it's so brilliant and it works every time. Like it just, it that's does. how you do it. It does. And, and the, I think the, the win-win, the, the, the really amazing part about this was I got to build it, you, the portfolio now is about 17 million. I got to build this with none of my own money. Yeah. He got to build this with none of his own time. I mean, he had made the money to begin with. <clears throat> he leveraged my knowledge. I leveraged his money and both of us are ex- very happy about it. 
And it's not a slight to him to say that he didn't do that part because he made the money to begin with. Yeah. And there's no way I would be where I am without him as my business partner. And and actually, <clears throat> he has a complimentary skill set to me. Like after we got further on down the line, and I'll talk about that in a second, um, he's really great at operations. So when we scaled and we got into vacation rentals, he's really good at running that. I'm more of the visionary type. So I kind of got this whole thing going. It's like, here's here's our strategy. I'm going to get it going. I'm going to put this into play, in, into action and I got us. I got us the momentum needed to get it started. And now he's the operations guy. He's just killing it with managing what we have and and optimizing that. So, so he's still your partner to this day. He's still my partner That's to this amazing. day. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. And and like Brandon just said, like anybody can do this. Now, what does it take to be able to to use other people's money to invest in real estate? You got to have an asset to offer the other side, right? Yes. If you don't know what you're doing. And you don't have any money. Why would somebody want to team up with you? Yep. The reason he wanted to team up with me is because I had built the the knowledge through the appraisal experience that I had. Mm-hmm. I was a licensed appraiser, and I was a real estate agent as well. And I'd owned some real estate, so you got to make yourself. There's got to be a, a compelling reason to partner with you. Yep. Otherwise, it's like they have the money, and if if they don't know anything and you don't know anything, what's, yeah. why would they split? Yeah. Yeah. everything with you. I love to you know? say like, there's like three things you need to put together a deal. You need knowledge, you need hustle and you need money. Yeah. So in other words, you have to know what you're doing. You have to have the ability to take action and you have to have the funds for it, but you do not have to have all three, right? You can have one of those or two of them, ideally two of those. So if you do not have money, just get the other two, get the knowledge and the hustle, know what you're doing, work hard. Yeah. Somebody else yeah. will have the money. And that's actually the best, like whenever I tell people that I do this, cause I mean, I've, I've scaled the 13,500 units by doing this exact strategy right? over and over and over. I have 2,600 partners at this point, right? I just did it on a large scale, but I, I started with one partner. My very first deal, I brought in a partner. My second deal, brought in a partner. Third deal, brought in a partner. It it works. Uh, it works if you work it. Yeah. Um, but so many people just sit there and complain, oh, I can't find a deal or I can't do anything. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, geez. So you leverage your, your skill and your time for yep. that. Tell me this, um, just partnerships, because there's a lot of people yeah. that are in partnerships. How have you guys made that work for what's it been, 12, 14 years now? Uh, yeah, yeah. We started in let's see, uh, 2017. Oh, 2017. Okay, so for <laughs> yeah, 2017. Eight yeah. Years. The amazing thing about it was we went from basically zero properties to enough income from these properties to both be financially independent in about five years. That's amazing. Now, we also had, I, I think it's like, you know, we put in the work, but we also had the market timing of the mm-hmm. whole thing just happen for us as well. 2021, yeah. markets went crazy. We, I'll, I'll back up and, and tell kind of some detail on yeah. this. Like, um, we did the burst strategy. Okay. So we would buy distressed properties, get those properties fixed up, rent it out, refinance. And I would say single, the, single, single, family? fa- single okay. families. These so were in Fort, Josh Dorf, Fort Worth, Texas. That. Shut your mouth. Yeah. <laughs> Shut your <laughs> yeah, I just want to say how great it is. That it, 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 I just want to say how great it is that so I've talked about the burst strategy on so many uh, podcasts, and I'm now sitting with the guy who coined the term burst Thank strategy. Thank you. Thank you for acknowledging yes. this. Dude, and, and what does it feel I'm like? I'm kidding. Dude, it changed my Thank life. You. Thank it you. It changed my life. I'm glad. I, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. What is, you I need my ego times. fed more, <laughs> Look, so please I, keep, I going, keep it going. What does it feel like to coin a term <laughs> that is so widely used? I mean, yeah. how does that feel? feels amazing. Yeah. Like I should have trademarked it and made some money you off should. this. Sure. Instead, so. yeah, instead everyone else is writing the books on it. And, but and I mean, that might it. be, it's okay. It's okay. I don't that mind. might be the greatest PR tool you've ever come Me up with. Because <laughs> every time I hear burst strategy, it's like coined by Brandon Turner. That's funny. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's like out there marketing for you. But no, I think actually there's, there's a secret here is all like, I mean, I probably coined a hundred terms in my life. Like, cause I, I'm a teacher, right? So I teach yeah. things and I'm, and two of them ever took off, house hacking and Burr. That's it. So uh, there, there's a lesson in terms of like the 80-20 rule or whatever. Like, mm. So if you if you have a concept you want to teach, just put a word to it. If there's no word to it already. And then just start talking about it. Every once in a while, one in 50 might take off and be something big. So <laughs> I love it. Just like real estate making offers. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah we, <laughs> it's we, true. We, we we did Burr strategy. And okay. so we, we focused in on Fort Worth, Texas. Okay. Why yeah. Fort Worth? Well, we were we originally started in Little Rock, Arkansas, but we were concerned after we did a couple successful burrs and didn't leave any money in. I was like, okay, the Achilles heel of this whole strategy may be that this market doesn't appreciate as fast as some of the mm-hmm. others might. And the the whole I, I think the attractive part about the burr strategy is the equity you're building, right? Yeah. Like if your properties aren't appreciating, like if you're just doing burr strategy and you're getting your money back, you're getting, you're basically getting free real estate for your work. But if it's not appreciating at all, that, you know, that, I don't know, that, 
that hockey stick appreciation and and portfolio value growth that you want, mm-hmm. it, it's not going to happen, right? It's going to be very slow. You're you're capped by how many bird deals you can do. But if you're in a market that's appreciating well and cash flowing, that's like having your cake and eating it yeah, too, right? Yeah. So we were like, where can we cash flow two hundred dollars a door or more? And it's also going to appreciate. We we feel like it's going to have a good chance to appreciate well. And we identified. Huntsville, Alabama, and Fort Worth, Texas. Okay. Well, when we looked at Huntsville, we just couldn't find the volume of deals we needed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We looked at Fort Worth, we found a lot. There was plenty of volume there for us. And I knew Dallas-Fort Worth because I'd been an appraiser out there. So yeah. I knew all the neighborhoods. So I was like, I know this market. I can handle this. So we did long-distance burst strategy stuff. We were I was teaching at Harding, and so that's Arkansas. Uh, my business partner's in Huntsville, Alabama, and we did all, these stu- all this stuff in Fort Worth, Texas, long-distance. So I had contractors that I managed through video yeah. calls and over the phone. And I bought stuff from wholesalers predominantly. And that's how we built the whole portfolio. How did you pick Fort Worth? Obviously, you'd been there. Yeah. Um, but other factors that played into that, because obviously, you were right, Texas has blown up. Yes, yeah. I think it's the fastest. Yeah, what do you look for? In the United States. Yeah. How did you identify that? Yeah. So I wanted, I wanted a place that aligned with my, um, my, my political views, where it was like, pro business. And so it naturally eliminated a lot of places. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted a place that I felt like, you know, there was a lot of job growth going on. Mm -hmm. And so Dallas, Fort Worth, check that box. And then I wanted to be able to know the market. Yeah. Like I didn't want to invest blindly in a place I didn't know about and not, and be out of state, right? If you're out of state and you're investing in a market, you don't know, you need somebody that's got knowledge on, Mm -hmm. on everything. So, so Huntsville, my business partner was there in Fort Worth. I, you know, I had lived there checked all those boxes. And so there's a lot of places eliminated that were good markets. It's just, yeah. I didn't know the market, yep. you know? So that's kind of how I uh, drilled down to that. Which I think f- for anybody that's listening, that's such an important aspect. Because I, I talk to people all the time that want to be remote investors. Um, and I'm doing it now, living here in Hawaii, but investing in St. Louis. But it's because I spent three I grew up there and then I spent three years investing there yeah. and I know every street in St. Yeah. Louis and I know, and, and it's tough because an out state investor will go there and literally the entire, you know, the entire neighborhood can change just one street over. Yeah. Um, and you see people getting taken advantage of all the time where the wholesaler is selling them a house on the wrong side of the street, yeah. pulling comps from the other side. And they're yep. like, Hey, that yeah. works. Um, and so I think that's important. Like you knew your market, like the back of your hand, cause you appraised thousands of homes there over yeah. Yeah. a course of, you know, X amount of years. So on that note, do you recommend that a new, somebody who wants to get into real estate investing, do you recommend becoming an appraiser for a few years? The value. So appraisal is a dying profession. Yeah. Uh, reason being it's very tedious work. Um, like you guys just said, I don't really like appraisers, right? <laughs> It's that's how everybody feels. Why do you not like appraisers? Well, because best case scenario, they appraise your property and the deal goes off without a hitch. You never see them again. Yeah. Worst case scenario, you're like, this appraiser just killed my deal. Yeah. So yeah. it's like a, it's like, you know, it's like, how do you ever build rapport? It's with a neutral or a lose. Right. Exactly. Way. There's no yeah. Win it's like, there's, yeah. you know, and so the, the pay has not kept up with, with inflation. Mm-hmm. So appraisers aren't making more money, you know, keep up with the cost of living and the cost of everything. Um, That being said, the best reason to become an appraiser is the skill set of being able to, uh, to recognize value Mm -hmm. and become like a ninja at that. Yeah. You don't have a course on that, do you? Do a course on uh, on appraisals? No. Dude, you could probably have like a course, like a simple, like two hour class. You just put together like just how to evaluate a thing, charge 49 bucks for it. You'd you'd make so much money, man. (laughs) Dude, Dude, you should do that. Yeah. (laughs) Good thought. Because my maybe we'll have actually. Here's a here's a here's the question. Can I? I'm going to ask you this question. Okay. Will you come and teach a class for an hour for the Better Life Tribe, which is all for charity anyway, uh, to teach our members how to appraise a oh, property? Now that now that's a compelling, interesting right? thing, right? Yeah, there. yeah, that sounds more interesting. Okay, yeah. all right, we're yeah. gonna make yeah. it happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Gonna, what yeah. if <laughs> real quick? I'm going like to go it. down a list real quick of what I look for and tell me yes or no. So, okay. distance, quarter mile or closer. Uh, Again, it depends. depends it depends. So you coming. want the closest. As an appraiser, you're looking for the best comparables available. Uh-huh. So why does it depend? Well, take, for instance, I appraised an NFL player's house in Dallas. In Dallas, This was this house was insane. Yeah. It had a bowling alley. It had a <laughs> swimming pool in the shape of a dolphin because they got to play for the Dolphins living in Dallas. I don't know. <laughs> had a bowling alley, had an arcade, had all this crazy stuff. Well, is there another house like that uh, next mm-hmm. door? No. 
It's like, I got to go, I might have to go all the way across Dallas to find the next house that's similar, you know? So it depends. That being said, the average appraisal is like 1,200 square foot or 1,500 square foot, three bed, two bath with a two car garage, you know, depending on what part of the country you're in. You just want the closest thing that's similar, Uh right? So that's, that's, that's your answer. Always, you know, if you have two properties that are the same square footage, same bed, bath count, same year built, and they're right next to each other, that's a great comp, Mm -hmm. obviously. You know, if they're in similar uh, shape, you yeah. know, if, if one's been updated and the other hasn't, you need to look for one that's similar to the subject. But but just because two properties are close to each other doesn't mean that they're comparable to each other. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you know, if you're in a, a developed neighborhood that was built by the same builder in 2007, those comps are going to be the most comparable to your mm-hmm. property if they're there. But sometimes what you have in smaller markets like where I am There'll be a house for sale pending, but there's no sales in the last 12 months in mm-hmm. your neighborhood that are similar in size. Yeah. What do you do? Well, you got to go further out. You got to expand your parameters and find the most comparable sale available. Yeah. And that's where you get into like having issues with appraisers, right? They got to put data in their report, to support the value today, mm-hmm. but there's no comps. So what do you do? You use the best comparable sales available. Well, then the, the, the buyer and seller get the report and they're like, I don't love these comps. Yeah. You're but- like, the appraiser doesn't either. <laughs> yeah, the last issue I had, he pulled a house from eight miles away. Right. Because um, it was the same school district. Okay. And I've never wanted to go to somebody's house more. And, <laughs> and, and we contested it and everything and couldn't get it changed. So we yeah. had to take a $35,000 price reduction. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, that's that's rough. It was. It was not fun. Um, well, not fun at all. So would you suggest then to somebody that's just starting out um, – to invest in areas where there's solid comps, the neighborhoods are the same, they're track homes where it's everything, like you just said, three bed, two bath, two car garage. Um, is that where you would suggest somebody starting out at? Or would you suggest yeah. doing it if you were in like a more of a rural market where you don't have great comps? Like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have, it's all a risk reward mm-hmm. scenario analysis, right? Like if you're way out in a rural area, your risk is higher because you know, there's not as many comps and you can't mm-hmm. verify your comps as easily, right? So I would say, you know, I am an appraiser mm-hmm. and that's not predominantly what I do. That's not where most of my income comes from. Most of my income comes from my investment portfolio and I'm also a broker as well. But I'm an appraiser and I've gotten burned by appraisal values. Like I've had yeah. people come in low on my deals. Yeah. And I'm like, I think it's worth this. They come in low. But ultimately the market will decide what something's worth, right? Like like we did a, on a bird deal, we had bought a deal for like 125. We put 25 in it. I knew it was worth 200. I was mm-hmm. like, it was like, there's comps right next door. The guy came in at like 175. I was like, <laughs> I called, I called him and I was like, look, respectfully, I've got comps in the same neighborhood, similar in size that say this is worth 200. And they're like 175. I was like, we'll see what, we'll see what happens when I sell it. Well, we put it up a couple months and it sold for 200 first yeah. day on the market. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, this guy just did, a, it was just a bad appraisal, yeah. you know, but what did he say in that case when you talked to him? Like, was he like, hey, listen, no. I, I know my data. And yeah, he he just he wouldn't he wouldn't have a conversation with me. He's like, he's he's like, you know, a lot of appraisers are old persnickety guys yeah. who just yeah. they're like they're like lawyers but antisocial. Yeah. You know, <laughs> they're like don't, they, they're just gonna defend to the death what they're saying. Yep. And so I'll answer your question by saying this: like margin of safety is your mm-hmm. friend when it comes to what investment properties you should buy. So I'll say this, like you can, you can always protect yourself by having a wide margin of safety. You mm-hmm. don't know what somebody's going to appraise something at, but if you've got a hundred thousand dollars of equity on your deal and they come in 20 grand low, you still got 80, right? Yeah. But if you're doing really thin deals and you've got 15 grand of equity and they come in low, yeah. it might've just screwed you, yeah. you know? So so I would say like margin of safety, like you can't guarantee an appraisal value. It's just a part of the whole process, but if the market, like, this is another thing to think, uh, to, to remember when you're doing appraisal, uh, for appraisers especially, I think. This is like, there's hardly any, probably any appraisers listening in because I, I don't think appraisers, like, try to learn how to be, become better investors. <laughs> but for the appraisers out there, if there's five buyers all fighting over a property, all willing to pay the same above market price for something, that's telling you that property is worth that. Yeah, yeah. Right? But appraisers don't do that. I mean, because we... This appraiser does. That you, do you do that? <laughs> yes. So, like, because we've, we've had houses before where we've submitted yeah. 10 offers that are all well above what they come at because they have appraisal writers or what, you know, yeah. that are all well above where they've appraised that. And we said, obviously, the market has dictated yeah. that this is worth X. Right. And you're appraising it at X. And then I think that they get 
you know, at least in my experience, they get defensive. Yeah, and they're yeah. like, yeah. no, this is it, and we'll yeah. try and contest it or right. something like that. And then we'll have to tell the buyer they, they got to go find a new lender because we can't yeah. work through their lender. Yep. And so, like, what, what do you do in that situation? Well, or do you just so, so this has been a really challenging environment for appraisers mm-hmm. because of exactly what you're saying. Like, fundamentally, the problem is not that the houses aren't worth. The problem is the inflation with the dollar. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if the dollar to... is worth 8% less this year, and it's going to cost more money to build the properties, yep. right? So the cost approach, that, that's the cost approach. That's going to become more expensive. Well, if you just don't have enough sales in the last year to support that this is now selling for more, it's because the dollar is worth less. So there's more dollars chasing the properties. Mm-hmm. So the appraiser's got to understand that, like, what if inflation's 100% this year? Yeah. Well, now everybody, now you got twice as many dollars chasing the same hard asset, which is mm-hmm. real estate. So, if, so obviously the house has got to sell for twice as much just to keep up with the, the value of the dollar, right? Because mm-hmm. dollar's worth half as much. Yeah. Right. So the appraiser's got to reconcile, like, you know, we've had really high inflation over the last few years. We've also got a housing shortage in good markets. Yeah. So you've mm-hmm. got high inflation, not enough houses. And then you've got buyers like, and you got, and then you got this like, interest rates that have been raised. Mm-hmm. So there's not people that don't want to sell. Yeah, so you don't have properties coming up for sale. You've got too few houses uh, for sale that people can actually buy. So they're fighting over the properties when they go up for sale. Then you've got high inflation. So stuff's selling for higher mm-hmm. than than the comps show. So what do you do as an appraiser? Because it's like, well, the market says it's worth this. There's not enough houses. If I were to build the same house, it would cost more than. Mm-hmm. X per square foot, which is le- you know more than more than it's actually selling for right now, it's a hard it's a hard situation to appraise in. Wild man. Hey, what was your like kind of volume look like when you did the when you, that, that phase of the burying the single family houses? And, like, what were you doing? Yeah, uh, how many deals at once? Yeah, how many or, deals did you? Uh, just like total, one, I mean, how many deals did you do? At one point, we were doing ten at once. We were selling oh, some geez, flips, yeah. and and yeah. we started off a lot slower. Yeah, right. We started off doing one or two at a time, and then kind of worked up to that, but. We built a portfolio. I want to say it was it was twenty properties. I think it was worth about five million dollars. Okay. And then, um, yeah, to finish that whole story, that was all in Fort Worth. Twenty twenty one. I sat down with my business partner. And we were like, okay, we've we did the math, and we're like, we got like two and a half or three million dollars of equity in this portfolio that you know f- that we built through the burst strategy. But this thing's only cash flowing like fifty thousand dollars a year profit. Yeah. We're like, man. The return on equity here yeah. is pretty low. That's what we yeah. talked about in and the we ad didn't have earlier. That, yeah. We didn't have that Brandon you Turner didn't have the tool. Brandon Turner ROE. But, but we were, yeah, but we were like, man, the return on equity is not great on this. Yeah, and which I, is the case with most people today with yeah. with with properties they own because yeah. rates went up. I mean, prices yeah. went up so high. Yeah, I think I think every so often you got to look at your return on equity because if you're yeah. not, you, you could you could be getting far less than you think you're getting. Yeah. Right, and you feel like, well, I did the burst strategy. Like I built all this yeah. equity, so I'm just happy with whatever I can get. But yeah. you're like. You don't realize that we we basically said okay if we sell this and we move all this over into short term rentals yeah we'll go we started doing the numbers we we're like whoa we need to do this yeah. yesterday we we're like we'll go from fifty k to six hundred thousand yeah that's what we did so we sold we <laughs> sold everything over the next year we're like man it's going to be a complete yep. pain to do this but we got to sell because they were all rented all these things mm-hmm. were rented and we're like we got to let these leases burn off and we got to sell all these properties. I bet and you the average person's getting a less than two percent return on equity right now. The average probably. real estate investor who yeah. owns property more than five years is probably getting two percent at yeah. max. Yeah. So if you could shift that to ten percent, you five extra cash flow and your equity doesn't drop. Yes. I'm not good at math, but we've got right. about seven million dollars in equity and we cash flow about a hundred and sixty thousand dollars a year. Yeah, what you're. That? That's not good. Uh, where's my Where's my phone? Hold on. What's uh, What is one hundred and sixty thousand divided by seven million? It's a little more than two percent. Two point two eight percent. You are dead on the money, <laughs> yeah. man. So two point two eight percent ROE right now. Yeah, and that's that's if that. And I'm not questioning your your mm-hmm. run the numbers. Most people though, when they think they're making 160 k in cash flow, they're really making more like 80 when it comes to like factoring yeah. in the, the. That's pure cash. That's yeah, if that's pure cash flow, that which is, is a term cash, that I use. Yeah. But most people. They're miss so even if somebody else listening to this goes, well, I'm making 160. You no, know, you're probably making 80 if you factor mm-hmm. in the roof and the maintenance and the repairs and the vacancy and all that. So from people, even if they think they're getting three percent, they might actually be getting one yeah. percent. So if you could take that equity right now, I'm not saying you should, but you could take that and dump it into something that gets you, for example, like uh, not the plug open our capital, but like our one of our recent funds. It's like there's like a nine percent pref, like like nine percent cash flow on your money. 
you go from two to nine. Like that's a massive increase in cash flow. But you do have to factor in the fact that those loans are all on fixed, good for the most part, good that's, interest that, rates. That's and true. It doesn't really. I actually would argue it doesn't actually matter that much. Really? And here's why. I mean, people say sometimes like this is gonna be controversial, but I have a three percent loan. I have a two point five percent loan. I would never sell that. I'm like, well, it doesn't matter if you're paying an 80% loan or a 1% mortgage mm -hmm. or you're getting free. The only thing that matters is cash on cash return, equity, uh, and, uh, and, and cash flow. Like those numbers or IRR, if you really want to throw that in there, those numbers matter. So mm -hmm. the interest rate is irrelevant. If you're getting 2.28% and you're paying a 2% interest rate and you jump, dump it in something you have to pay a 9% interest rate, but you're getting a 10% return on your money, mm -hmm. You still 5X your cash flow, your equity stayed the same. It just doesn't really matter. That's I, my argument. And I, I don't can, I want to piggyback on this. Yeah. I could argue that you're even possibly in a better sh in better shape doing what he just said because when rates go down, you refi. You can refi and, your and now cash, cash, goes cash, goes cash and goes way up. Yes. Yeah. So if you can get higher cash flow at a higher rate, yes. it's probably worth doing that. Yeah. Because it's all about that. For me, it's all about that cash on cash return number. And, uh -huh. and, you know, Warren Buffett uh, compounded his money at 21% a year over his lifetime, became the wealthiest oh. person in the world. So you know that compound interest is the name of the game with this. So if you're compounding your money at 2.8% yeah, versus, versus 10%, it's yeah. insane. It's insane the, 20 years from now. Yes, 20 years. But there is so many other factors that go into that 2.8%. The fact that it's appreciating at, I mean, over the last uh, three agreed. years. Appreciation is a factor in that. You're right. The fact yes. that the loan is being paid down. I mean, you, you could sure. look at that and say that, because I mean, it probably has grown at twenty percent year over year. Yeah, you are right. Net They're worthwhile appreciation plays into it. But then yes. I would argue, is St. Louis going to appreciate as much as Austin, as no. much as Dallas, as much as probably not? So therefore, if you could shift from a, because we don't care about what it's appreciated in the past, we care about what it's going to going to appreciate. Yeah. So assuming all things equal, like in that regard, like going forward, what's going to is it better to get two and a half percent in St. Louis? Mm -hmm. or 8% in Austin. Not that you can get 8% in Austin, but let's, let's just yeah. say you could. It'd be better to get 8% in Austin because yep. still, from this point forward, it's going to mm -hmm. accelerate more yeah. in those other markets. But the only way... But you don't know Austin, and you could end up losing because of that. So. In, in my There's, mind, though, yeah. the only way to, to hit you know that 10% cash-on-cash return yeah. would be to either invest in a syndication or a fund, yep, which is or risky. Or do a short-term or mid-term yep, rental play, work. which is risky as risky well. But I want to hear, I want to hear. Yeah, I want to know your, your like, story. Yeah, yeah, you just yeah. tell me what you would do. Well, tell me what you did. And yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, yeah. So what we did was we're like, wow, we could go from 50K to 600. Mm -hmm. And we're like, you know, the I think the inertia for, for investors is having to sell. It's a pain having yeah. to sell, get tenants out or, or in their leases and sell. And then there's just the process of like, how do you move money over yeah. from a bunch of single families without doing a portfolio sale, yeah. right? So we we were like, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to group these into two or three houses and the market was hot. So it was easy mm -hmm. to sell. And what we had to do is kind of try to time it where we sell three and these are like selling for like 250 a piece. So we got like 750 grand of sales proceeds. We would do 1031 exchanges. So there's no mm -hmm. tax implications to this. And then we would 1031 that into a vacation rental cabin. Mm -hmm. And and the really amazing part about this is we time the vacation rental thing as well. So in your scenario, if you got your 2% in St. Louis versus your your 8% in Austin or 10% in Austin, you know, if you can reasonably predict that the property you're putting the money into in Austin is going to outperform or at least keep up with your 2.8% over over in St. Louis, then you could come out way ahead. So what we did is we moved the money into the Pigeon Forge Gatlinburg market and short-term rentals. And that market went insane. It was the perfect time. It went insane. Yeah. I mean, we bought one deal for one uh, four bedroom cabin. We got for like four fifty, mm -hmm. and within the next year, it appraised for seven fifty. We didn't do anything to it. It just appreciation. I mean, so that whole market just went bonkers because when I looked at that market, my first deal up there, which which is another another little little tip or nugget for the audience. My first deal I bought as an expired listing. I called, I started calling expired listings mm. and I was like, Hey, would you guys be willing to sell this for what you had it listed for? Cause I was running the numbers and I'm like, the cash on cash is insane on this thing. Mm -hmm. I was like, why did this thing, it had been pending. I was like, why did this thing fall out of contract? They said, there's a really bad foundation problem. And I was like, yeah. I own stuff in Texas. Like everything's got foundation <laughs> problems, have. you know? And I was like, what kind of foundation problem? They gave me the report. I was like, I'll take it. You know, so I offered the same price. And then I was That's a, a great strategy. I was a broker and I was like, I wrote that in as well. So I got paid 
<laughs> I got paid a 3% commission on this property. So I got a check at closing for nearly 20 grand to buy this property for way under what I thought it was worth. I bought that property. My, the cash down on that deal was 115000 The first year that thing cash flowed, I'm talking money, profit out the door, net of debt and everything, one hundred twenty grand. So <laughs> over 100% that stuff makes cash so on <laughs> cash return. Okay. And the beautiful part about this is I used a cost segregation study uh, to accelerate yep. my depreciation. Yep. I had that bonus depreciation and all that going. So I didn't pay taxes for years on my income. And that's right. where, to me, real estate just far outpaces everything else. Like you can change your life with the wealth creation that comes through real estate from the tax advantages. Yeah. You know yeah. this very well yeah. with your whole portfolio, but I mean, the tax yeah, advantages are ever. nuts in real yeah. estate. That's wild. So. Hey, if I could throw in one more math, I want to go back a second to one more reason to, to return an equity, why this matters so much. Let's say I'm going to get a little bit nerdy here, but math wise, but see if this makes sense. You buy a property for a hundred grand mm -hmm. over time. It, it appreciates to 200 grand. Let's forget about closing costs and all that, but it goes to 200 grand. You have a hundred thousand dollars in equity you built up and you're making a 2.5% return on your money. Should you, should you change that out? Even, even if you got a low interest rate, whatever that the thing is, let's just say the interest, the appreciation is exactly the same in St. Louis versus Austin, 5% yeah. no matter what. Well, 5% appreciation on $200,000 is going to add uh, whatever, whatever, 5%, oh, yeah. right? A little bit. You take that hundred grand though, and put that as a 20% down payment on a property in Austin. What are you buying? You're not buying a $200,000 property. You're buying a $500,000 mm -hmm, property exactly. that is appreciating at five, the same 5%. So even if the appreciation was exactly the same by buying a more expensive property with that equity, now you're accelerating 5% per year on 500,000. Yes not on the 200,000. So you're going to actually be making more than double the amount of money every year in appreciation than you would on the little deal. So and that, more than double like, the, that, and more than double the depreciation. And yes. more than double the, the yeah, the, the depreciation you're going to get a massive chunk yes. from uh from a tax savings. So it's even more reason why we should be looking at our equity and saying can I mean I'm talking to myself as well. Yeah. I got properties making 2% right now. Like yeah. I should be taking that and then dumping it into a more expensive property that ideally cash flows the same or better because it's going to appreciate. Now there, there's a risk question here, obviously, like, yes. you know, you, the Smokies could have gone the opposite way. Right. Exactly. Right? People could just stop. Airbnb just goes over and yes. nobody cares anymore. And now you're in yes. trouble. So there's a risk component we have to. There, there is. And the risk components there in St. Louis with your original property as well. Yeah. yeah there's risk no matter what. Yeah, there's, so. there's risk no matter what. So it's kind of like doing your homework and figuring out where do I think this market's going over the yeah. next five, 10 years. And then I think, being willing to constantly assess your equity and figure out, is it time to move it? Yeah. Cause it's a pain. Like mm -hmm. if you, you know, if you went and tried to sell all these apartments that you guys own, it'd be, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a complete pain. But, yep. but if you realize you got a 2.5% uh, return on equity and you're like, yeah. we could go from a billion dollars yeah. to 3 billion. You're like, yeah. Hmm. I got a property here in, Ma in Maui that I have 450,000 in equity. Yeah. And, I make zero cash flow on it. Like, I mean, mm. it breaks even every year. And the reason why is because it, it's a long story that I've told before, but the basically when I bought it as a three a three unit property, the, the county came in and shut me down and made me turn it back to a single family mm. house. So the mm. cash flow is going to be like, you know, or nine grand a month in revenue is now like four grand. Mm. So I'm, you know, whatever, but I've been keeping it for a number of years, but finally like uh, Micah, actually, one of my uh, team members at Open Door Capital was like, hey, can I just buy that from you? <laughs> and I was like, that's a great idea. Yeah. Like, <laughs> doesn't cash yeah, flow. Doesn't cash flow. <laughs> and all of a sudden, and he, and all of a sudden, now I'm gonna have a property. I'm gonna have that 450. I immediately turn around and actually did a private note on, on a buddy of mine has mm. a portfolio of of, uh, of rentals. And I don't do almost any private lending, mm. but he's like, "Hey, I'll pay 10 percent on that 450." I was like, "Yep, no yeah. problem. I'll do that right now." So yeah. I now I'm making on a secured loan 10 percent. Well, mm. I mean, it's all going through this week. So by the time this episode airs, I'll, I'll be pay getting you 10 and a half. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and so now all of a sudden, I'm, yeah, but I turned a, a property with lots of equity and no cash flow into now significant cash flow. Mm. Uh, mm. Yeah. So a lot of people sitting listening to the show right now are sitting with equity. Yeah. I mean, we could harp on this all oh, day yeah. long. But so, yeah. so a question for you then. Yeah. So, um, so obviously, you guys made the right decision moving to Gatlinburg. That area has exploded. Yeah. Um, but now I'm reading a lot about it's not. Just the short term, it's short term, down, yeah. I mean, it's slowing down a ton. Sure. So, so have you, found have that? you guys looked? First of all, yeah, have you guys seen that in your guys's portfolio? So the the, the market has, I would I would say it's probably it's probably reached an equilibrium mm -hmm. on the vacation rental income side. Yeah. Um, the the prices have ticked down a little bit, but not as much as I was predicting going into all this rate rate hike environment mm -hmm. that we've been through. 
Um, I'm, I'm a broker up there as well, by the way. Anybody listening to this that wants one up there, reach out to me. I'd be happy to try to help it you find like something. Sounds like I yeah. Need, yeah, it sounds like <laughs> I need to sell but, some properties and buy yeah. them. <laughs> But, you know, you're up against what, what everybody's up against nationwide. You've got higher interest rates, yeah. and the sales prices have not really come down a ton, so mm-hmm. it's harder to cash flow. So you yep. gotta look, you got to take some time and find a good deal up there. But the beautiful thing about these vacation rentals is you can do the cost seg. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can manage them yourself, and you can use that extra depreciation to basically give yourself a tax shelter, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of incentive there. Um, but... Your question, uh, what was your question? Your question was, uh, have, how do we? Have you seen the? Have you seen just things change in the yeah. the rental market? It's, it's then, slowed down. It's slowed down. But but um, the, one of the reasons that we invested in Pigeon Forge in Gatlinburg was when we looked at vacation rentals. First thing I thought, what do y'all think of when you think of vacation? Well, I know what you think of because you're you're here, but and you're here as well. Probably mm-hmm. bad audience to ask this. But first <laughs> thing I think of when I think of vacation rentals is a property at the beach, right? Everybody, yeah. everybody, was, oh, I want to get a beach house. Yeah, That's yeah. the first thing they think of. Well, when I was looking at the the, the beach uh, vacation rentals in Alabama, and it was like Orange Beach, yeah. Panama City, all that. Well, the lion's share of the income on those properties comes in the summer. I don't know what it's yeah, like yeah. here. Here, it's well rounded. All okay, year so round, see, yeah. that, this is a different different market. Yeah. But for me, it was like okay, beach stuff in Alabama. It's like most of your money's coming in June and July. We wanted something that was less risky Agreed. on the cash flows, and Pigeon Forge Gatlinburg was yeah. way more smoothed out, kind of like it sounds like yep. it is here. Mm-hmm. So that's why we identified that market, and and the cash flow has been great. And we looked at 2008. What did it do during 2008? During 2008, it just kind of kept bumping along. Really? Yeah, very similar. Like you didn't have the, the huge implosion of of values up there, like yeah. you did, like you did some of these other markets. So. Um, it has slowed down some, but it's it's still strong. There's millions of vacationers there the year every year. It's it's the most traveled national park in the U.S. Yeah. up there. Wow! So it's not my favorite area to vacation personally, yeah. but, and but I'll the say entire this, East Coast goes there, which is seventy percent of the U.S. Yes, population. And I'll say yeah. this for vacation rentals, like. People always say, well, I don't know if I want to go vacation there. That has yeah. nothing to do with it. Yeah. yeah. In fact, I would argue you probably sh- – like I generally advise people you yeah. shouldn't go on vacation in your own vacation. Exactly, rental. because you're basically yeah. just renting it from yourself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Losing yeah. the income, yeah. right? Like you want to go vacation where you your family is going to have the best experience. Yeah. Yeah. And then you want to rent your vacation rental out at the highest yeah. uh, revenue potential that you can, mm-hmm. right? So so getting something in Gatlinburg has nothing to do with where I want to go vacation. Like I like mm-hmm. vacationing in Asheville. Yeah. Yeah. And I like renting my Gatlinburg stuff because that's not my favorite place to vacation, but people love renting it. Yeah, so yeah. it cash flows well. What have you found has been successful with your vacation rentals? Like how do you stay competitive? What do you, are you higher end? Are you lower end? Are you like value? Great like, what question. do you do? Great question. So our, our most profitable and lucrative vacation rentals are the larger properties. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I think the reason for that is this. Um, so these large properties have like movie theater, uh, you know, they're they're like hanging off the side of a mountain, you know, with this beautiful view. Yeah. Movie theater, three hot tubs on the deck, <laughs> back decks of these things, um, you know, all kinds of like foosball table, yeah. all kinds of like video games and all that stuff. People, you know, some of these properties are like 12 bedroom cabins. These things sleep yeah. like 55 people. <laughs> and they're really nice. You know, they're beautiful cabins. So if somebody can pack like five, not five, somebody can pack like eight families in a property. Yeah. And then I'll split the cost. The vacation is actually cheaper for them yeah. than them going and renting, each family renting one cabin a piece. And yeah. they all get to stay there. All the kids get yeah. to have fun and stuff. So those properties actually stay booked out for us really well. Mm-hmm. The smaller cabins are the ones that get hit harder. And I think it's because there's more smaller cabins out there. Your competition's higher. Yep. And it's like, if somebody's going to pinch pennies, they're all going to cram a bunch of families in one big property instead of go rent the small one, mm-hmm. right? So that that's what we found has worked best for us. I so I would say, that. like, the nicer the property with the better amenities tends to be more competitive and, and more lucrative for us. How much are you renting out a property like that per night? Oh, man. It's, it's, it's all over the map, depending on the season. Uh-huh. Like, you know, some of these cabins will rent for uh, $25,000 a week. Wow. It's crazy. Yeah. But that's, that's in high season. Yeah. Like you're in slow season or, you know, slow times, it may be 200, $250 a night, mm-hmm. you know, but yeah, I know it's yeah. been hard. Like I, I run a lot of different random masterminds, whether it's yeah. better life or the 50 or whatever. And we like, and over the years, I mean, we've done, you've been to my mastermind, you've been yeah. to my masterminds, mm-hmm. right? Like I actually, the ideal for me is to rent a giant house. Cause it's way more fun to have everyone hang out. Right. It is so incredibly hard to find yes. nice, huge 
properties. Yeah. Because whenever I find them, they're already rented, out, booked out. Exactly. So I've always thought the same thing is I would yeah. love to own some big. Yes. My house in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, I put, like, I haven't rented it out yet for anything, but I got 22 beds in that house. And oh, I yeah. did that on purpose because I'm like, I can rent yes. that out to Mastermind. So if anybody has a Mastermind and wants to rent yeah. my house in Idaho, <laughs> uh, it's legit big yeah. house. One with like a bunk room and the whole thing with that idea of being, I could use this for masterminds or just for families who want a vacation together. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Last year, I think we had five families staying at my house for mm. Christmas. Like, yeah. it was super fun. Like in yeah. the 4th of July, we do it too. Taro comes out every time. And yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. Is there any worry in Gatlinburg that there's going to be any sort of like legislation passed that, um, no. I mean, I'm not worried about that because the the cabins up there are kind of the backbone of the, of the whole town. Yeah. And like they, there's so much vacation traffic, and when people go up to Pigeon Forge, Gatlinburg, they're in the mountains. They want to stay in a cabin. Yeah. yeah. So if they took the cabins away, I mean, people wouldn't vacation. Up it's kind of like if they took condos away. I think yeah. here in Maui, right? Where I don't worry about yeah. my condos. I don't worry about them going away. I mean, yeah. there's rattling every once in a while about it. Yeah. But I generally don't worry about because that's what they're for. Right. Like that's mm-hmm. what they're designed and for. <laughs> one reason that we looked at buying stuff in like Dallas mm-hmm. and you know buying these Airbnbs in, yeah. in big cities, and one reason we stayed away from it is we're like we don't know if they're going to change the rules there. Yeah. And, and they, they probably are. And they, and they did. They, did they are. I feel yeah. like Scottsdale's yeah. getting that yes. quite a bit. Yeah. 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 Where all these are buying yeah. into the neighborhood. Yep. And renting out a house. Yeah. So, yeah. All those areas that are popular to live in. Right. That those are going to be hit the hardest mm-hmm. for Airbnb because yeah. the first thing the government's going to do when housing gets tight is it's their fault. Yeah, exactly. It's the Airbnb guys outlaw them. Yeah, and that's yeah. what we're seeing in every single city. Yep. So I've been saying this for years, like only buying areas where it's either like it's designed for tourism yeah. or the laws have already been figured out. Like mm-hmm. I love the idea I of buying in Vegas because Vegas doesn't allow any Airbnb. Like they're really tight in Airbnbs because mm-hmm. it was Wild West for a long time. All of a sudden Vegas is like, no more. Yeah. So if you can figure out how to do it in Vegas, mm-hmm. you're going to print money. And so, yeah. like, I'm not saying doing it legally. I'm talking about just finding the loophole. Like, for example, yep. here in Maui, it's the bed and breakfast permit, mm, yep. right? Mm-hmm. If you can get the bed and breakfast permit, which means you live in the property and you rent out the other unit, yeah. you're allowed to have an Airbnb. I mean, you yeah. got to apply for it and it takes a couple of years, but like, you get that. You're one of the very few Airbnbs that's in a, not in a condo. Yeah. You're going to be able to print money for years mm. because you're the, and they're not going to change that rule. Like, yeah. you got the permit, you did it legally. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of that. Do it where the laws have already been decided yes. or in an area that's clearly designed for vacationers right. that would destroy their economy if they outlawed it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I feel like uh, Table Rock Lake and Branson is a, is it? Is, yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's already area. blown Branson up a, yeah. Um, yeah. in terms of that, but I mean, it's just, it's, it's like Gatlinburg in a way where it's close to a lot of major cities. It's some, yeah. something that people can go to for a little weekend getaway. Um, it's close to St. Louis, Kansas City. Uh, Little Rock, you know, Northwest Arkansas, yeah. even Memphis, yeah. Nashville, people can get there pretty quickly. Yeah. So it's comparable uh, to Gatlinburg Pigeon Forge mm-hmm. because yeah. that is a vacation destination. Yeah. Yep. And like and, like most people aren't trying to move there and live with their family. No. Right. There yeah. are some, but yeah. but most people are wanting to go up there and get a cabin on a lake or something. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it's very yeah. similar. Cool, man. Yeah. All right, man. Let's really shift this over to the last kind of uh segments yep. of the show. Time to go to uh, the three, two, one pivot. The okay. idea of this section is talking about a pivot, meaning your life's going one direction and something changes it and you move it in a whole different direction. So let's start with books. I'm going to go three books, two people, and one quote. So books, what three books have changed the direction of your life? The one that, the one that I've read most recently that's had a massive impact on me is The Creative Act by Rick Rubin. Oh, I haven't read that. I just oh, it. Yeah. so good, man. Really? I mean, he, yeah, he, he just defines the creator and the process of creating art so well. And he's, you know, he talks about how everyone is an artist. Yeah. And I believe that's so true. Like everybody's got their own God given talents Yeah, and they, they're able to create their own art. And it's just the way to create art is, is to not be so focused on what people are going to think about it, but more mm-hmm. be kind of true to what you want. Yeah. And if you create something you love and you're proud of, then other people are going to love it too. But if you're out there trying to create stuff that other people are going to love, then they may not like it that much yeah. and you may not like it yep. either because yeah. it's not authentic to, yeah. it's not authentic to you. So um that one was huge for me. I mean I can't I mean if you're talking about books that have impacted I got to yeah. throw Rich Dad Poor Dad on yeah, there. Sure. I know you probably get that one every episode, but I that one goes without saying. I mean it just kind of turned my brain on to like how this whole real estate thing could yeah. change my life. Another one is uh War of Art. I love War it. Of yeah. War of oh. Art. I read that one just blew me away. I probably read that one three or four times. It's just 
such a cool book. When we when we started the tribe, we sent that to every single person that joined the Better Life tribe. Right. I, I think we've probably paused it at this point, but yeah. we sent it to I mean, a thousand people. Got uh, Stephen Pressfield's War of Art. Should be requ- yeah. required reading in school. Yeah, we had him come speak to the tribe too. As oh, well. really? The very first uh, like That's financial amazing. freedom hours, we had uh, him it. come speak. Yeah, he's a. Yeah, War of Art. By the way, just so people aren't confused, it's not the Art of War, no. which is the Chinese like which war, is also a good which point. also yeah. <laughs> yeah. But this is the War of Art, yeah. which is yeah. I, I think it's required reading for yeah. anybody in any sort of entrepreneurship. It's All amazing. right, two people that have changed the direction of your life. Who are two people? Two people that have changed the direction of my life. I would probably say uh, you know outside of family, obviously. Mm, yeah. I'd probably say my entrepreneurship professor in grad school. Okay. Um, I just I was like your textbook you know, entrepreneurial kid that like, I just struggled to really find my niche in school. Mm -hmm. And I always just kind of thought like, I'm either not good at this or something's off here because I just, I was not very interested in all of it. When I got in my entrepreneurship course in grad school, it's like a light bulb went off where, you know, he, he was more interested in how we're wired in our own giftings and how to use that in a productive way in life Mm -hmm. than he was trying to get us to be a certain way and teach us a certain formula. And um, and that just changed my life. So so my entrepreneur entrepreneurship professor just kind of recognizing like everybody's got their own giftings and um, let me think. I'm trying to think of my my second person. Second person that's changed. Uh, is the question changed my life the yeah, most? Yeah, it changes yeah. just the direction of your life. Doesn't have to be most. Like it but changes the direction be... of my life. Probably my business partner. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah. my business partner yeah. showing up with that money and saying, "Hey, I want to start yeah. a real estate business." Yeah. I mean, I. I think I would have done real estate anyway, but I don't, I don't think I'd be nearly as far along as I am now. So, yeah. yeah. That's amazing. All right. What about a quote that's changed the direction of your life? A pivot quote. Pivot quote that's changed the direction of my life. Um, I think the I think the quote of, you can, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with others. Mm-hmm. I'm not even sure who said that. Yeah, you know who said that? I don't, but. But it's, the, it's so true. Abe Lincoln probably yeah, said it. Yeah, <laughs> probably. <laughs> Mark it's, so, it's so true though. It's <laughs> like Cuban, yeah. it's like you can go so fast alone, but it's but it's not the way that you're really going to be able to stay in the game long term. Yeah. And I think you've done such a great job at that and building this this uh, this whole Thank thing you. that you've built here. You're great at getting people together, mm-hmm. creating synergy, and I think that's why you've been so successful. You know that that initiative. So Thank yeah, you. awesome. Um, well, we're going to look at um, the next segment, which is the past, present, future. Yeah. The first thing that I want to ask you is if you could go back to, you know, 20, 21-year-old you and you're just getting into the appraisal game, um, what is something that you would tell that 20, 21-year-old Josiah? I would tell my younger self that uh, wealth is not what you think it is. Hmm. I believe wealth is being grateful and thankful for what you have. Mm-hmm. So I believe you can be wealthy with no money. Yeah, mm. uh, And... I don't think I would have been able to know that without having millions of dollars and knowing that it doesn't change you at all. It's just, you just have more money, yeah, right? Yeah. You've, you almost got more stress and responsibility when you have more money. It's nice because you can pay bills. You're not as worried about that side of things. But mm-hmm. but I truly think that the, the game changer in life is just being thankful and grateful for what you have in front of you. Mm-hmm. Like if if you ask someone you know, how much money they'd be willing to pay to save the life of their kid or their wife or something, they'd probably just say everything. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't have to have any money to be thankful for your family, right? And like just sitting on the patio last night, watching the sun go down, watching the whales come up, yeah, yeah. just being grateful and thankful for getting to be a part of that. Like that's worth, how much is that worth? Like you can't really say how much it's worth, right? So I think, I think true wealth is just being thankful, you there's know. there's a it's Instagram account I just started following and I'm probably gonna butcher it because I have a bunch of periods in it but it's like today I'm grateful for it's like today yeah. dot I'm dot whatever and every day this guy just kind of like this just average looking dude he's just like today I'm <laughs> thankful for hills and mountains yeah I mean the fact that we can go walk up a hill yeah. and then see there like yeah. every day it's like today I'm thankful for screens yeah. on Windows because I can enjoy life and be outside like somewhat yeah but not have bugs eating me you yeah know? Like, and I'm yeah. like that's a cool account just every day one thing yeah. It's like yeah, a random, and it's, it, I mean, yeah. it's it's so easy to like you see the inverse, like you know when you when you like own a business or like you run a restaurant, you get all the complaints, like oh this was wrong and that was mm-hmm. wrong, and it's like it, it's a it's a way of looking at the world. Like when you start becoming thankful for everything yeah. instead of like looking at all the negative, mm-hmm. 
it just becomes so freeing to you yeah. because now everything's great and like nobody can take that away from you. Like mm-hmm. you can't control what happens to you. You can only control your response yeah. to it. Yeah. Right. I've heard um, that neurologically you cannot be thankful and angry at the same time. Mm-hmm. Like your brain doesn't allow it. That's, and that's a great point. Yeah. So like when you like when, when you sit yeah. down and write out a list of what you're thankful, that immediately can change yeah. your mood because you mm-hmm. literally cannot do that and be angry at the same time. Yeah. Um, and so that's awesome. I love mm-hmm. that. All right. So that was past. Let's go present. What is currently your number one rule for living a better life? Maybe it's related to my, that, my number one else. rule is honoring God. Okay, mm-hmm. what does that mean I, to you? I, well, I've found that when things get the most out of whack, it's when I've lost focus on my faith. Right, yeah. like when you become too self centered or too focused on some goal you have, and it's not about just honoring God. Like, it's not necessarily about your goal; it's about honoring God with that goal. Like, is that yeah. something God? Is that a? Is that a? Is, are there spiritual principles there, or is that something you just want for whatever yeah. reason? So I found that like you know, honoring God with, you know, how you go about doing what you're doing. Are you trying to love others well? Are you trying to put others before yourself? When I'm doing those things, then everything else seems to fall in line. When I get off that track and it's not about God, it's about me, then everything can go sideways. Hey, related note to that maybe, um, but I I was going to ask it earlier and I forgot, so I'll throw it in here. You were pretty heavily on social media for a long time, mm-hmm. and you were like building up an account and had a big following and a yeah. podcast, and then you disappeared for yeah. a while, right? And then you came back. What was yeah. that about? What was the what was the disappearing? Yeah, yeah. So, so the whole reason I started my podcast, or my or my podcast originally was to share the journey towards financial freedom, mm-hmm. and I reached that uh, I reached that goal, and I was like super stressed out. I was in terrible shape. I mean, I've lost like 50 pounds. I was going to say, when I shape. saw you here today, I was yeah. like, whoa, he got in shape. <laughs> I, it's because I was, I was real stressed. Yeah. I was, I was really out of shape and I got sick. I was like sick. Mm-hmm. I mean, really sick. And I was like, okay, I got to make some changes. Like, mm-hmm. and you were talking about, you need to get out, get the ringing out of, you know, get the notification silence. Yeah. I was like, I just need to, I need to get off of social media for a while. So I just shut that whole thing down and I was like, and I was, I was thinking about deleting the account while well, I deleted, I deleted the app, but didn't delete the account. Yeah. Cause I had people telling me, don't delete your account, man. Yeah. You've got, you know, and it's like hard because I have relationships on there yeah. and I care about those people, but it's like, how do you unplug without sending the yeah. wrong message? Yeah. You know what I mean? So I was just like, okay, I got to get away from this. Yeah. So I just took time off and, and, um, and then worked on my health um, and then wanted to come back and reconnect with people. So yeah, that was kind of the whole reason for all that. Yeah, mm-hmm. all right. yeah, yeah. So I don't know. I, I you know, it, it, I feel like social media is a double edged sword. Yeah. It's like it's great for connecting like this. This happened mm-hmm. through social media. Yeah. I wouldn't know you if it wasn't for social media. But there's all, but it also can become a distraction. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. from things yeah, that matter it really most. Can. So yeah, cool yeah. man. Yeah. All right, love it. All right, and so we we haven't talked we didn't talk about this we didn't dive into family kids but I know you have three kids correct? yes three kids yeah. Ages? two girls and a boy ten eight and six all right yeah six. you're in it yeah. Just, yeah you're in it yeah <laughs> six yes yeah, so we're six four and two so like, yeah. like we said the exact same just yes. a couple years apart but yes so I, I love asking this question because I think about it a lot is um, you know someday you're going to die and yes. your kids are going to sit around after your funeral and talk about you and tell stories about you. And what do you want them to be saying about Josiah in that moment? Yeah, I, I would like for, for them as well as others to say, you know, he, he honored God with his life. He loved people, you know, before himself, and he lived a bold life. Mm. That's what I would like to do. Hell so, yeah, I, so, you know, and, and obviously, like, I fall short of this a lot, uh-huh. but you know, if I think if you leave life and you can say that you tried to help uh, people best you could, yeah. And you know, when you screwed up, you kept trying, yeah. Like that's what I want, and yeah. I think honoring God, like my faith, is such a big deal to me. Mm. I think honoring God kind of takes care of a yeah. lot of it. Like if you're honoring God, then a lot of that stuff takes care yeah. of itself. But I, I just don't want to live a timid life uh. that sat on my talents, that that played too um, mm. conservative. Yeah, like yeah. I want to get out there and live, and I want to teach them like failure's okay. Like you, and sometimes failure's messy. Yeah, people say, "Oh, failure's great," you know, so you're learning and all this. Sometimes failure's like, you know, people are like, "What's wrong with that guy?" Yeah, like he's failing. Like, but as long as you don't give up, as long as you keep going, then you can turn it around and you can you can get better from it. Mm-hmm. You know, some of the worst failures turn into the, the biggest victories. Yeah, you know, so so yeah, I love that. Yeah, amazing. What do you love about your wife? 
Oh man, I I like I know people probably all always say this, but I feel like a way out punted my coverage. Like my wife, <laughs> when I met my wife, I was like, outside of like this girl's this girl's hot, you know, this girl <laughs> this girl's attractive. Like she was working in homeless ministry at the time, and um and when I went down to this homeless ministry, um after church, she like knew all the all the people down there. She knew all of them, and I was like, man, this girl's different. Like because most a lot of girls I knew were like terrified to go be involved in stuff like that, and she was out there, you know, meeting people, getting involved and stuff. And she just got a heart for people. Like she's a counselor. So she connects with people faster than anybody I've ever met in my life, and yeah. she helps people with their problems. And sometimes, like, real estate, I think sometimes you can kind of feel like you're not making a difference, like you're just getting transactions done. Yeah, She goes and runs her counseling, you know, practice, and it's like she's helping people with depression, anxiety, suicidal, all this stuff that's, like, direct impact, like changing people's lives, and I'm jealous of that. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, like, I just I, I love how great she is at connecting with people. Awesome, man. That's yeah. Amazing. All right, time for the wrap-up. What are you excited about in your life coming up? What's happening soon? Man, I'm just excited for what for what God has in store. And, like, I'm excited, like, you know, talking about the Creative Act by Rick Rubin. Like, you know, I'm I'm working on a YouTube channel. Okay. Uh, the name of that is Trails and Forts, and it's about living— Trails li- and Trails forts. and Forts. It's about living a life of adventure, you know, oh, going cool. back to when I was a kid, uh-huh. riding trails, building forts out in the woods, That's you great, know, that man. kind of yeah. stuff. And— um. Yeah, just I want to go out there and be bold, live a life of adventure, connect with people, you know, do 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 awesome stuff. And talking about living a better life, like my income from my real estate is allowing me to do stuff like be here right now, mm-hmm. you know, work on this YouTube channel. You know, I'm I'm I want to get a nonprofit going, try to help a lot of people through that. So that's what I'm most excited about going forward, and just raising my kids. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah. That. So where, where can people find you, find your Instagram, and yeah. hopefully follow your YouTube channel when you launch that? Where can people find you at? Yeah, yeah. So the Instagram is just my name. It's Josiah Smelser. So I spell you, your last name? S-M. S-M-E-L-S-E-R. Okay. Yeah. So you can find me there. And then I've got a link tree there with all the other links. So it's got a link to the the YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've got a podcast, which I it was Daily Real Estate Investor, but I, re- I rebranded that to Josiah Smelser Show. So it's just my name. Mm-hmm. And it's the reason being is I've I've branched out from just real estate to more mindset, limiting Love belief, it. conquering limiting beliefs kind of content. So there's a link to that. That's on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and all that. And then yeah, I'd love to connect with everybody that's that's willing and interested. So cool, man. Yeah. Appreciate you. Appreciate you coming on. And yeah, you have a book too. I want to plug the book. Yeah, what's your book? Yes, Dream It and Build It. Okay. Oh, How to Crush Your Real Estate that. Investing Goals. And that's yeah. on Amazon. Yeah, and I'm working on getting that on Audible. So oh, I've cool. had that request. Yeah, I got to do that. But yeah, well, now that's you got on a Amazon. deadline. When the yeah. episode comes out, it's got to be on yes, Audible. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> All yeah. right, man. Appreciate you. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on the show, guys. This awesome. Thank you. Dude. It was a blast. Yeah. yeah. Three way. Boom. Yes. Boom. Yes. Three way. There we go. Oh, I miss it. We always, there we go. There we go. (laughs) And that, my people, is the show. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed uh, the insights from the episode. And hey, before you go, if you enjoyed this episode or you enjoy the show in general, please consider leaving us a rating and a review wherever you listen to podcasts. We really do value your feedback and we read your comments to make future decisions about topics and guests and everything else. Plus, it helps us reach more people the more reviews we have. And last but not least, please head over to social media and consider friending, following, subscribing and all that stuff uh, to both Better Life at Better Life over on Instagram and my own personal at Beardy Brandon for more. That's Beardy with a Y at the end of it. Beard with a Y. Brandon on you know YouTube, Instagram, everywhere else. Thanks again for listening. I am honored that you would bring me along on your journey to building wealth without losing your soul. This show has been a production of the Better Life Tribe, copyright 2024. Our producer is Kevin Leahy with Podcast Point Man. Our videographer and uh, all-around talented video guy, Carson Smith. My co-host is the amazing Cam Cathcart with DealFlowRealEstate.com. And finally, you know, this show has been all about living a better life. But if you want my spiritual answer to what it takes to live not only a better life, but the best life, head over to abetterlife.com forward slash best life. I got a 13 minute special video for you there. For the Better Life Tribe, my name is Brandon Turner, signing off.